Good evening. Thank you for joining us here today. My name is Andrea Douglas, and I am the executive director of the Jefferson School African American Heritage Center. Um, this is our, I believe, fifth conversation in our Evelyn Barber lectures um, for 2023, um, wherein we are um, considering the question of blackface on white power. Tonight, we will be joined by Dr. T.J. Talley from the University of San Diego, who I will introduce in a little bit. But first, let me tell you a little bit about the Evelyn Barber Lectures. Um, for most of us who knew Miss Evelyn before she died, or Evelyn Barber, we called her Miss Evelyn. And for me, she was a beloved mentor. But Miss Evelyn uh, passed in 2014 at the age of 78 after a short illness. Um, she attended the Jefferson School and was among the first graduating class of Jackson P. Burley High School. She was an alumnus of Virginia Union University and the University of Virginia School of Education. She taught in various school systems and retired after more than 30 years of service. Evelyn was a lifelong member of Mount Zion First African Baptist Church, and her most notable work in the church was her role as historian. And arguably, her most notable work in all of our lives, those of us who knew her, was that of historian. I first met Ms. Evelyn when we began the project of the Jefferson School African American Heritage Center and um, thought of her as both a, a friend and a beloved mentor who really helped me understand, certainly, the power of the story that we tried to tell here at the Jefferson School. And I could think of no one else that I would name such an important lecture series after. Ms. Evelyn believed in history, but she also believed in the impact on contemporary life of understanding history. So this Evelyn Barber lecture series tackles a subject that is a, as a consequence of a push for organizations to create cultural um, spaces that promote safety for everyone. Unfortunately, what began as a good thing has been in some way co-opted by and transformed by the very systems that uh, were created long ago in opposition to this goal. This year, we're talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. How has changed since its inception, and has it changed for the better? So I'm very pleased then to, to welcome our guest tonight, Dr. T.J. Talley, to help us better understand this space and this field um, that, you know, for one reason or another, sometimes feels fraught. So let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Talley. Um, uh, he is an associate professor of history at the University of San Diego. He's also the director of Africana Studies and um, the, liaison, the equity liaison for the Center for Educational Excellence at the university. Um, this program is uh, one where he creates uh, programming for faculty to plan teaching that is racially responsive. Um, he has been with uh, the University of San Diego since the fall of 2018. He specializes in the comparative settler colonial and imperial history with a focus on South Africa. His interests broadly defined involve colonialism, gender and racial identity, indigeneity, and religious expression. And at UCSD, he teaches courses in African history, global history, Pacific history, and gender and sexuality. His book, Queering Colonial Natal, Indigeneity and the Violence of Belonging in South Africa, was published in 2019 by the University of Minnesota Press. PJ. If I may call you that, how you are did. you? I'm so good. It is so good to chat with you and be here today. So I'm, I'm I, absolutely. I, I feel like although this is one of our first meetings, I have known you for a while, <laughs> and I'm still looking forward to our conversation. I think that um, the the areas that you work in really uh, nuance this kind of conversation that we've been having. That has been largely localized in the states mm -hmm. but has a global impact because of its its because of its origins and so i'm going to just jump right in with you because i feel like we've got tons of to talk about with very little time to do it <laughs> um i am fascinated by your research i really am especially 
reading about your even most latest project. Um, I think that this work is, um, is, is at the core of thinking about the globalization of identity, not just um, this sort of localized sense of self, but understanding more broadly that these, some of these notions are created within a, within a, within a much larger global spectrum. So can you tell me a little bit about your work and specifically how your career path led you to Washington and Lee in Virginia, where you taught until 2018? I can, I can indeed. Thank you so much. So, yes, I. Um, the first thing is that I graduated from the University of Illinois um, in 2014 with my PhD um, in history, and it's a comparative sort of colonial history. I was I was trained as a as a critical British Empire historian that focused in South Africa, and I worked in both Zulu and English, and um, I'm fluent in Zulu as well. And so I um, was hired at Washington and Lee in 2014, and um, immediately became their newest African historian, which was very exciting and also a lot. So I'll talk a little about my work and then how that got me to WNL. But um, so my work is fundamentally concerned with the um, larger questions of sort of belonging and identity and making space. And so I've been trained as sort of a critical colonial historian. I'm really interested in thinking about um, places of settler colonization, right? So places where people come to already occupied indigenous lands claim them and then say, oh no, but we live here now forever, right? And so there's a distinction in a lot of African history. There's a lot of um, sort of what we call crown colonies or colonies of extraction, right? And yet um, these colonies did not have sort of white populations that came to move, right, long-term. And so for me, I became really interested in thinking about in a South African context, how do we understand when Europeans arrive in African spaces and they make claims to belong, how do they do this? What happens when they do this? And how do people negotiate these sorts of feelings and identities, right? And so the larger questions there are thinking about how do we use queer theory? How do we use indigenous studies to think about this? And I, as a black American and as a queer person really was interested in thinking about these things when I studied abroad as an undergraduate in South Africa, but I went back and spent a year during my PhD doing it. And so my larger goal, just to sort of sum it up quickly, is my larger work is comparative questions about settlement and how people make claims to belonging. And so in thinking about South Africa, thinking about places where are occupied by uh, Europeans over indigenous land, and then subsequently when they bring in other uh, migrants from places like uh, India, um, there's a lot of complicated questions about belonging and identity that happen. And so in general, um, I find that this is a really provocative and useful space to think about the settler society we occupy, right? So as a professor, it's very easy to talk about settler colonialism in South Africa because white people never become the majority. So it seems always something alien and foreign. But then this opens up a way to think about other types of English speaking settler colonies like Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the US. And if we can think about how messy it is that South Africa is there or that Dutch speaking people called themselves Afrikaners, meaning Africans, then can we too very critically think about what does it mean for Europeans to call themselves Americans, mm -hmm. right? So this is the sort of larger ambit of the, the projects that I work on. My current research project right now is on, it's called Conjugal States. And I look at how monogamy is used by settler societies, specifically around a threat of polygamy. So in Zulu and Maori societies, um, and to a certain extent in First Nations communities in British Columbia in the 19th century, there are, um, types of plural or multiple marriages. And so this is seen as we have to defend monogamy and Christian civilization. And I find it really fascinating because then this is a racialized way to think about sex and the body. Mm -hmm. And then we have a lot of panic in the 19th century when suddenly white people act up and when the Mormon church is founded, the LDS church suddenly becomes mm -hmm. this sort of model of white failure. They're like, but this is not what white people are supposed to do. So what my work right now is thinking about these sort of larger stakes of race and gender around marriage. Um, but all of this did take me to uh, scenic Washington and Lee University. Um, I was trained as a historian and I was hired immediately as an African historian there. Um, and WNL in 2014 was really seeking to sort of really pivot, right? There was this sort of moment that they had just had a, a bit of a reckoning thinking about how um, for the last 80 years, they had Confederate flags in their main central chapel where Robert E. Lee, their president, cause president, 
um, and former Confederate general was buried. And so there were this chance of thinking about how do we change this institution and make it a new and meaningful space. And so I was brought in as part of a series of sort of seeming progressive forward thinking hires. And I was under no illusion that this was gonna be a lot of work, but oh my God, was it a lot of work. So thinking about what it meant to spend four years there as an African historian on a place built by enslaved peoples where Robert E. Lee is buried was a lot. <laughs> I can imagine, I can imagine. So, um, so, so tell, I, I want to dig a little deeper into just that moment for a minute, because I, sure. I think that is a, the crux of almost the conversation that we're going to have, right? Yeah. Because in some ways, you're, 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 you're not an African-American historian brought there. You're brought there as an African historian, which means in some ways, this notion of this, or, of this, of this institution extending itself broader than this mm -hmm. cultural space of, 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 Virginia and deeply grounded in its Confederate um, histories, you know, it allows in one way or another to 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 allow the college to to present itself as progressive because now it's teaching African studies mm -hmm. in that way or another, right? Yeah. So in that in those moments as you're as you're engaged in your teaching. How are you being received? What's the, what's the student body's reception? What's the faculty reception? How are you feeling as you're being placed in this, in this place of exemplary um, or exemplifying the progressive space that this institution wants to now create for itself? Absolutely. So I think that one of the interesting things about arriving in Virginia and then W. Nall in particular was this real sense of I've arrived and how do I navigate this in my own body, right? Which was clearly felt like it shouldn't be there. Now, to their credit, I will say that most of my colleagues at Washington and Lee were extraordinarily kind and welcoming, majority white, um, and were receptive largely to difficult conversations that we we're having there because they understood, right? Now, there were a few that most absolutely were uninterested in them, and <laughs> but they were relatively easy to avoid. Um, and our student body as well, um, did skew slightly conservative, but again, one of the fun parts about teaching African history means that students often can self-select. Even if they take history, that doesn't mean they're necessarily going to take me, right? And so mm -hmm. my students, my faculty tended to be relatively self-selecting in a positive way for me, but mm -hmm. that didn't take away from the fact that as you said so well, there was this sense of having to be self-exemplifying, right? Where I had to be, um, you know, I was one of four African-American faculty in the college and I was one of um, six sort of black faculty, right, in general, because um, we had other, uh, we had two African nationals um, who were amazing and great colleagues. But I, um, I struggled, right, in a lot of ways to do the work because I was expected to be this sort of exemplar and witty and clever and interesting and also challenging, but not too challenging. And so mm -hmm. it was a lot where I was expected to, I was brought in to make change, but also not too much change. And that I'm happy to talk about more because that really awakened me to sort of what I think are the, the quintessential sort of tensions when we think about diversity at a lot of predominantly white institutions, right? What are the inherent tensions about what these types of institutions can be and what DEI work and what diversity or transformational work actually is? Um, because I think that we have to be honest with ourselves that universities are fundamentally conservative in their orientation and implementation. And I mean this specifically in that we cannot, we cannot avoid thinking about the fact that no matter what the right says about universities as these sort of hotbed woke activist factories, universities are by their very nature designed to be conservative in terms of little c conservative in terms of decision making and also about implementation. Because what universities do is that they offer a type of knowledge that is valuable in its own abstract sense, but it's right. also only valuable because it is gate kept like diamonds, right? Not anybody can just get a degree. A degree is valuable because not everyone has access to it. And so by its very nature of existence, a university is a place that, that sells in subscription form access to a type of knowledge that becomes valuable because it's restricted, right? And so right. that level of restriction 
is inherent in the process. So universities, no matter what they say, are not ever going to be inherently liberatory, right? They can provide, I tell my students, I provide you with tools for self-analysis and liberation, but we cannot mistake that for being in this room, right? Being in this room is not an inherently liberatory act. It is powerful because bodies like ours were not allowed in them before, but that doesn't mean it's inherently liberatory any more than it's inherently liberatory for me to be an American citizen, even though I didn't have full citizenship rights a hundred years ago. And some might argue, 70 years ago, and some might argue Thursday, but yeah. Yeah, and I think that's, you know, and in particular at a place like Washington and Lee that has so deeply embedded in this kind of historical position that makes it even more, uh, you know, this notion of see conservatism and self-selection, you know, yeah. there are reasons why people choose Washington and Lee right. in the same way there are reasons why people choose the University of Virginia mm -hmm wanting to be part of a particular kind of tradition in history mm -hmm. right, at that level, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, okay, so you leave Washington Lee in 2018 mm -hmm. and you start your new position in um, San Diego. Yeah. And certainly, you know, you cross cultures because you moved from one coast to the next. Mm -hmm. Deeply different mm -hmm. um, perspectives from one place to the next. Mm -hmm. um, and so, Within your teaching base, with all of the understanding that you have about the connectedness of the sort of historical space that you live in, um, and four years is a good amount of grounding in terms of your first teaching position. I think that was a, a very good learning space for you for this, this next role that you acquire mm -hmm. uh, here at um, at, 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 uh, UC, uh, at University of San Diego. I want to, I mean, I'm going to get to this place where we really are deeply embedded in this conversation, but I feel like I don't want to leave your biography yet only because I feel that it is so very endemic yeah. of what so many of us go through, right? Mm -hmm. In terms of the kinds of things that we're interested in, mm -hmm. moving into institutions that are so deeply embedded in their own traditions and then being asked to do almost the impossible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because your students carry with them a, 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 a certain kind of cultural coding. Mm -hmm. The institution has a kind of cultural coding and you're being placed in, in not opposition, but certainly contradistinction yes. to those spaces mm -hmm. and asked to sort of, you know, be Hercules. So, yes. So you get to the West Coast. Is it the same? And if not the same, how is it different? Oof, I'm happy to answer that. So one of the things that was hardest about WNL, right, was that Washington and Lee specifically, it chose, it made a choice that its institution, what they wanted to bank on was that they were this august institution since 1749. They wanted to bring this heritage as their major argument factor, right? Mm -hmm. They wanted this, they wanted this full, you know, institutional Southern heritage, even though, to be very frank, it's rotten from the core in terms of enslavement and racist violence. But they had this sort of luxury of wanting to pretend, but we don't want to think about that part. We wanted to think about the historical valueness of it. Mm -hmm. Literally, as a historian, I can tell you that those things are, you can't shape, you can't pull them apart, right? But what they wanted to do then is like, I want you to imagine me at a train station, um, where I having to hold onto the rail at the at the train station while I'm also holding onto the pulling away train, right? So the train station itself is this sort of solid sense of, you know, this is our history and our heritage and it is steeped in violence. But then they're like, we want to be a cutting edge, world class, top known um, institution for, you know, global research and progressive values. And, and so the train is pulling away from the station, but I am also literally tied to that post and now i'm my arms are going in both directions and so my body is being forced to do this right and so when i left washington lee i was like well oof, yikes um <laughs> now one of the things that made me very clear about what i was doing is that when i arrived at the university of san diego it is different on some levels the university of san diego was founded in 1949 so 200 year difference it's a much mm -hmm. younger institution and it really takes its current form in 1972. So it's really about 50 years, right, of this institution. It doesn't have the same built-in, caked on, you know, burnt in um, alumni network experience way of being. Um, mm -hmm. It has a much younger alumni base. It's much more nimble in terms of being able to pivot or respond. 
Now, that said, don't get it twisted. One of the things that made it interesting enough for me is I worked on what was ostensibly in some parts of the back campus of Washington and Lee were a functioning plantation in the 1860s, right? 1860s. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And of course, during the 1830s and 40s, um, enslaved peoples carried carried book bags, delivered coffee, did all the things, right? Um, so I, I, I worked on a functioning plantation where instead now my queer black self, who is an anti-colonial historian, now mm -hmm. moved to the Catholic University of San Diego in San Diego, which is explicitly designed and built to resemble a Spanish California mission. And all of the buildings and the artwork are made to look like this. So there right. is something equally messy about now my educational institution is made to look like a genocidal religious project. We're like what? what? Um, and so, <laughs> so I often, I used to joke that I worked at Confederate Hogwarts and then I ended up going from Confederate Hogwarts um, to colonial cosplay, right? Like what, what? Um, and so, and again, this is the sort of nature of, right? An institution is wanting to look and be different while also not being different, right? And so, and this is all fairness to the University of San Diego. It's much more deft at moving because it's less baked in, this institution, but it is deeply tied to sort of like wanting to hold on to these sort of Catholic identitarian structures. And that's mm -hmm. fine having Catholic social teaching and religious teaching, but there's been a lot of work, especially in the last 15 years explicitly about how do we then critically engage with what has been deeply harmful colonial missionary activity. And one of the things we talk about is what would it mean for a Kumeyaay, an indigenous Southern Californian, to step foot on this campus in a way that it felt like for me as a Black person to walk onto the Washington and Lee campus, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's a profound mm -hmm. slap at your, your, your physical existence, right? Right. And, and so on some levels, WNL prepared me really well for USD. I mean, first, I did feel like a honeymoon phase because I didn't feel like my soul was being graded with a cheese grater every day just walking around. And... Mm -hmm. I'm from Southern California, so I'm fluent in this particular type of PWI racism, right? Which is sort of like polite and implied. And it's this sort of um, idea of this sort of polite implied racism rather than and like a direct in your face racism, right? right. And so, um, so I'm fluent in this language, right? I, it's racism with guacamole rather than racism with grits. And, and yet... I love your analogies. I love them. <laughs> You're like, mm, this book of money is delicious with it. It's still racism. Um, great. And so how do we sort of figure these things out together? So it was better and better in some ways, but it gave me the tools to recognize how messy it was, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, I, okay. So, so this is an interesting sort of fact about it because, you know, when you think about the, the areas of your interest, you are a religious historian. Mm -hmm. You, you know, so it really is an interesting shift in terms of the ideological questions that you're being forced to ask from one place to the next. Absolutely. And then you ultimately enter into this space of the Center for Educational Excellence, yeah. right? Which then causes, creates, in my mind, a, a level of authority making for you because mm -hmm. now you're here, you're, you're at that place where you're like, uh, where your job is to prepare faculty to engage in questions that you have thought through quite deeply throughout your career right. in a place that says that, that is of that kind of cosplay that you have described itself. Because none of these people actually, well, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming, like, let's be honest, I'm assuming, none of these people think of themselves as anything but progressive. They're Californians right. after all. Generally, right? yes, yeah. Or, or, or at least um, they are California, their transplants to California, and as you say, you understand the language and the and the and the positionality of people in those kinds of spaces. Yeah. So let's get to this notion of DEI and now this new role that you acquired. And right. and how long have you been at um, San Diego before you became this person in charge, this liaison to the faculty? How so long have you been there? That's a great question. So my my first uh, two years at uh, USD, my first three years at USD, I was still on the tenure track, right? And so mm -hmm. from 2018 to 2021. And so starting in 2021, 
I, I got tenure in the middle of 2021, huzzah. But then these sort of processes happened. First, I became the director for the Black Studies, the Africana Studies minor, which we created, right? So I, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm now a professional Black person. Um, <laughs> and, like, and then in the starting six months later, so, so that was exactly three years in, and then three and a half years in, I became the racial equity liaison for um, the Center for Educational Excellence, right? So my job was specifically to do this work, but also attune people to thinking about how do we do this with racial equity? How do we think about our teaching to be more racially respons racially responsive and culturally inclusive? And how do we think about ways in which all of us, whether we're teaching physics or um, you know sociology, have to think about the way in which we occupy the classroom, right? And it doesn't have to be didactic and unpleasant. And it's just like critical ways to do this, right? And so, mm -hmm. yeah, so it was about three years in and it, it really does dovetail onto any type of minoritized faculty. And, and, and I will include, I, mean, I want to say marginalized rather than minoritized. I will include obviously women in this category, all women, right? Um, queer people, people of color, um, people with disabilities, um, any of us, right? As we have already made it through the impossible maze of um, getting tenure, which is a, mm -hmm. a deeply fraught process. Then usually the next step is congratulations on, on getting tenure. Now we're gonna rope you in to do a specific set of things that are upon your own personal interests, right? And so <laughs> I my responsibilities ratcheted up significantly a, a, above just teaching, but became, and research what became about how do I try and create this? And to USD's credit, both the minor and the position really do emerge as a series of thoughtful responses to uh, George Floyd and the racial reckonings of 2020, right? Which come out of a very specific principled stance all black faculty took, right? So the black faculty drafted a letter, had a series of, of demands and, and, and engagements. And so this was a good faith effort by the university to do this. But of course, this good faith effort means that I now have triple the work. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, but I feel like anybody who does this work immediately feels this. You're like, cool, I'm helping to make spaces breathable, but I have to do this work, right? And so it is my job now, literally. And I get, I mean, I'm compensated for it, but I do this additional work to do racial equity, right? And so that becomes yeah. the expectation, right? Is that now this is the work I do. And and to think about this more firmly, like to sort of pivot to think about, about DEI itself, right? Like one of the one of the things that I, I think about when organizations like USD create DEI work, right, is that there is not a, a deep-seated asking of why are we doing this? That is often a deeply reactive process. It says, oh my God, people think we are racist, we have to fix it. Um, and so, and it from a conservative institution, right? The institution is not about making grand changes. It's about what is the least we can do without getting people to yell at us, right? And so DEI often, diversity, equity, and inclusion, becomes fundamentally, um, if I can be very critical, it becomes a process of asking for diversity without difference. What they want is they want diversity because they don't want criticism. So they want brown faces or maybe queer faces or more women or maybe someone who is disabled, um, maybe a trans face, but they don't want to actually make any changes to the institution, right? And this is the, the fundamental bind of DEI. Right? right. If you are doing this shit correctly, and I felt like a curse word needed to be appropriate for this, because if you're doing this shit correctly, things will change. If you are if you are hiring new people and bringing people from diverse backgrounds and experiences, things need to change because their bodies don't line up. What we think is a universally ex expected idea. Everybody had a lemonade stand and everybody had swim lessons by the time they were eight, right? Everybody mm -hmm. has a particular way of, of navigating um, social behaviors. Everybody has a particular set of socioeconomic markers. Um, we all know what is in and what isn't changes. But often these institutions just want a superficial veneer so people don't crit critique them. And instead what happens is that our bodies get brought in and then we become what Du Bois said, right? We become the problem, right? right. I mean, how does it feel to become a problem? Um, and and this is what you know intersectional feminists have been talking about you know since the you know since the 1980s right um this sense of how do we think about how our bodies are then brought in but the by our very existence we trouble the issue and therefore we are then seen as the problem and right. and that is the fundamental issue with di is that if it's brought in just to address criticism 
if it's brought in in a reactive way, it's not, it's always doomed to fail, right? What it's actually doomed to do is make the DEI workers who are doing this often out of their own sense of self preservation and from a sense of trauma that they've accumulated over their time in academia is now they feel doubly responsible that they must also end the racisms and also um, be responsible for all of the inequities when it is not their fault. So, you know, that's an interesting position for someone like you. I mean, we were talking off camera and you were talking about the fact that you were in Stanton in, in what we just celebrated, the sixth or celebrated, we recognized the anniversary of August 11th and 12th. And you were saying you had hurt yourself so you weren't able to, to be in Charlottesville. Mm -hmm. But that suggests to me that in your mind, there is a sort of political activism that is deeply embedded in your, you know, you have a particular social consciousness, yeah. right? And so to be in this position then, on the one hand, is, is, is difficult. I, I hear you saying that. But on the other hand, does it play a role in what you believe your activism looks like? Yeah, I, I do. I think one of the things that is actually, here's the irony about, I often now do DEI workshops outside of the university, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the things I do, because I'm very good at telling other people what they should do and not listening to it myself, <laughs> how dare you, um, is that I remind people, especially marginalized people, so women, people of color, queer people, disabled people, right? trans people, gender non-conforming people, lots of y'all, y'all know who you is. Um, we internalize this work because this work is part of making our lives breathable mm -hmm. and livable, and therefore it must be done. And therefore there becomes this retro, this, this assumption on both parts of the marginalized and the centralized, right? Which is the term I would use for people who are not marginalized in some identities. And we all got a little bit of both, right? Um, but thinking about being marginalized peoples then take this work on and feel like they are required to do it, right? Um, mm -hmm. And we feel like, we feel this inherent thing that like, if we do not do this combined with those of us who went through all of the, the trauma of being honors kids and academics, right? Where we must feel responsible for all of us at all times, everything is a test, right? It, there is a sense that, and if you think about it, it sounds ludicrous, but I, I think that both you and all of our listeners will agree, there is this believed and felt presumption that if you are doing DEI work or if you are just a brown person in a predominantly white institution, your job is to end racism. Right. right? And I want to think about that for a second. And I might even use a curse word because it is so fucking ridiculous. Right? Be careful here. It's fine. Right. I was like, you thank you. But I would say it is fucking ridiculous. It is not my, and I would say this very clearly to both of us and to people listening, it is actually not my job to end racism. Ending racism mm -hmm. is not actually my job description. Not not one bit, they don't pay me for it. Um, because the, otherwise they would probably stop creating so much damn racism. Um, but the sense of ultimately, I internalize this as a sense of, I have to do this. I have to do this, if I'm not doing it, then what am I doing and who am I? And also this is the work, which also gets me to continue to do DEI work, right? Because I'm deeply invested in it. And so when I do DEI trainings, I ironically point this out, that one of the first things I wanna tell marginalized people is that this is actually not your responsibility. You are welcome to do it and you should be able to feel the, the value and the joy that comes from it. Ending racism is not actually your job. Ending racism is the job of white people, mm -hmm. right? Because it's like being black is actually not hard. Like being black in a, in a white supremacist world is hard, right? <laughs> like being black is awesome. Um, and, and so one of the things I have to remind myself is I, this is not my actual job. And I forget it. I pick it up all the time, right? I'm like, oh, I got to do this today. I got to be good. I got to I got to be clever. I got to be interesting. Otherwise, the racisms will win. Right. But the, I mean, the, the brutal truth that is deeply freeing and deeply depressing on every level is, right, we will in no way, shape, or form end racism in our lifetimes. And I want to be just very upfront about that. I will not end racism in the work that I do. It is too big of a project. And that said, now that said is depressing as hell, but that doesn't mean that I shouldn't try to do it, right? Because there's plenty of things that I will not, I will never be 163 pounds and I don't actually want to be, but I would like to maybe just continue to work towards a certain trajectory with my body, right? But similarly, I also like, it's not my job and I cannot actually change it. 
And I think on some level, instead of feeling deeply depressed by that, that needs to be relieving. A moment where you just take a breath and say, oh my God, I actually can't do this. I'm asking, I'm setting myself up for an impossible assignment, mm -hmm. which is to end racism. And you think about it, I know every person that has done this DI work has somehow thought that their job by Thursday was to end racism. And if you think about it for more than five seconds, that is bananas, right? That is a bananas thought. And so one of the things that I think about this is I deeply internalize it. I do DEI work in my life because it makes the world more safe for me and for other people like me. But also, this is not my whole existence, right? right. This is not why I am here. Um, because what happens is that those of us who do DEI work, who do DEI, DEIJ, DEIB work, whatever you want to call it, those of us who do it can very quickly come to mistakenly assume that doing this type of work is what we are required to do. And it is the job of white people to receive our gift. Right. And instead, right. instead of thinking like my job is actually, I was, I can assure you that I and nobody else listening was put on this earth to make white people's lives more rich and fulfilling. The only people that believe that are the people that wrote the blind side and we know how they messed up. So um, I think ultimately, this sense has to be, we cannot do it. We cannot end it. And so we still should do it. And there's work to be done. But it is not my job to end racism. It is not physically possible. And what I can do is make small moments of change. And sometimes, if I know I can't end racism, it actually helps me to take a step back and be like, maybe I need to take care of myself today. Maybe okay. I don't actually need to make Madison with three wise lives better today. Maybe I don't need to make, you know, Chad and Benifer feel better, but my job is actually to live. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and I understand the freeing part of that. I mean, yeah. you know, hearing you say it to me makes me feel free for a minute, you know, like the right? hands that can't solve all of Charlottesville's problems. Mm -hmm. I feel, you know, yeah. you know, there are days where, you know, I that boulder gets big. But I'm wondering about the workshops, because if, 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 in, in how do you move people with that kind of mindset, right? Mm -hmm. Going into that, what are you asking them people to um, accomplish in their uh, uh, sensibility about racism? That if you understand, if they're understanding that they're, you know, even as we say, it's small steps. But right. what what do you think that people who do your workshops walk away with? their understanding of their capacities then. Um, because we're always talking about allies or cohorts or collaborators or all of those things. We do ask something of, mm -hmm. of people in the work, mm -hmm. even in the DEI space. So if, if you're going in in that place, where's the, what do you come out at the other end? Mm -hmm. I love that, right? So I think about this Obviously, I do sort of the very intro DEI things too to start, where I like we can do like a gender, gender equity, pronouns, um, mm -hmm. sexuality. We talk about implicit bias. I do implicit bias training. I do specifically just sort of like blackness, anti-blackness, and then and these are ones yeah where I invite people, especially those who are not marginalized in these ways, to think about what is the work that they can do, especially because they are the ones who benefit from the status quo, right? Mm -hmm. And then the secondarily the the. The, the sort of more advanced here diverse uh, DEI work I do is this one called limits of diversity. And mm -hmm. it is a call to all of us to think about what are the limits of what diversity can do. First off, we don't know what we want out of diversity work, then we are already doomed to fail, right? But then mm -hmm. secondarily, once we think about, okay, we want to make these sort of transformations, then for those of us who have the marginalized identities, the limits of diversity have to be the recognition that this is something that we do, but it is not who we are. And right. also it has a stopping point. And also because it is absurd for any of us to internalize the idea that we must end the, the systematic oppression we experience as our as our job. But similarly for what do we call them, allies, co-conspirators, the nice people in the room, the limits of diversity for them have to be a radical engagement because it is very easy for, for men in feminist spaces, for cisgender people in trans groups, for straight allies, for white people, right, for able-bodied people to assume that their job is simply to learn from and be better, more thoughtful people as a mm -hmm. result of the work that is done primarily by the oppressed people. And so I say, no, the limits of diversity here are, that's not it. 
there has to be an invitation for you to proactively engage, challenge, and do the work externally. And especially in, in circumstances like around um, gender, race, sexuality, one of the things that people prize who are in the central positions is civility. What they prize is civility, and by that I mean comfort. They would much rather let a racist or homophobic or sexist joke or colleague exist and everybody hope it blows over because it feels uncomfortable, as opposed to sort of like personally threatening. And so one of the things I say in the limits of diversity is, no, that limit is here for y'all. You have to be uncomfortable because you know who's uncomfortable every day and is expected to be uncomfortable? The marginalized people, right? And so it's a higher invitation for people who are more centralized to step up, right? Mm -hmm. To do that, to mm -hmm. do that work. And again, that I think grows out of the idea that it is not the job of the marginalized to, to end the oppression because they technically can't, right? Like, don't get me wrong. I think that, you know, Black people were instrumental in ending their own enslavement through a variety of practices, right? Especially through outright physical resistance and violence and pressure, right? I'm not saying like, oh, only white people could end slavery, right? Not saying that at all. But what I am saying is historic structures of oppression need actual buy-in and need actual responsibility from the people who benefit from them. And so I think about that as someone who is generally a dude, right? What are my, what are my obligations living in a misogynist and profoundly violently anti-woman society? It's a lot of work that I have to do. And it is not about me waiting for women or or non-binary people to to um, sort of like take the brunt of this. I have to actively tell men to stop doing things. I have to make my male-male relationships uncomfortable by pointing out misogyny and not standing for it. And that's the work that I have to do, right? And And that is the limit of then expecting like diversity training around gender and equity to be like, women should be the ones that do this work. And we're like, mm, no, right? So, so I think about that, right? There is the sense of, um, I'm never going to end racism, <laughs> but also it means that because it's not going to end, there are still people who benefit from it who have an obligation to do the work. I'm going to open it up a little uh, for for questions. If you have any questions uh, for Dr. Kelly, please um, uh, let us hear them. Um, and while we're waiting for the questions, I've got a, a, a dig into to something that you've said. Um, because I think that um, as you're as we're talking about people needing to step up and creating this space of discomfort, I believe that that is in effect the quintessential place where DEI kind of falls apart mm -hmm. is in that space of discomfort. Mm -hmm. That the that while our co-conspirators understand intellectually the the idea of needing to step up, there is that emotional uh, place that says, I'm putting myself in harm's way when I do that. Or that um, that the, the degree to which discomfort becomes, moves past intellectual into, mm -hmm. you know, real life. Mm -hmm. um, have they yet questioned that, that limit? And I wondered what you what you think about that the emotional pieces of, of the DEI work that you do. Because yeah. it certainly does demand a shift from the mind into the heart, even. Mm. Mm. Oof, you ain't lied. Right. And I, I think that's absolutely right, right? I think that DEI is often billed as a conservative action, right? It's lower case C. Um, conservative action, where it's designed to be, what are the least we can do to avoid being critiqued? Mm -hmm. And I would say that actually what we're trying to do is push ourselves to be far better, right? And mm -hmm. we have to make change and change is deeply uncomfortable. And I, I do think that I am often an ideally placed person to do this because I have the temperament and the general sass to say something that is hard but also say it in a funnier, witty way. So people are like, <laughs> oh no, right? And so that, I mean, this is a constant choice, right? I am wearing a neon green crown that looks like I attacked Kermit the Frog. I am looking somewhat less threatening. I am a queer, light-skinned black person with painted nails in a way that occupies very specific body performances, right? And in so doing, I'm really aware of the fact that I am still doing comfort work, right? But it is also done with a purposeful edge, right? 
I am literally saying like, oh, isn't this funny? Do some fucking work, right? And that that is, I think, the potential and the productivity of DEI and DEIJ, DEIB has to be that, right? That element of of pushing, because otherwise it really is always done. And so frequently, those of us who know this, DEI work is often done just to feel comfortable, to feel like we did the thing, we checked the box, and now we don't have to think about it anymore. Why is everybody still mad? Right. Yeah. Right. Um, here's a question for you, and I'm, I'm going to hold that thought too. But um, our educate as our educators, we understand a rich history. Education begins with local history, helping students relate how they and their community fit into the bigger picture of American and world history. Um, and so, I think Annie's just making a comment. She's not really, um, and I think that's that 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 actual comment though does lead into the question um and someone nancy damon wants to know what's the student body at U usd like Who, who's your audience for this i guess yeah well i can and i can think i can answer both of those so annie i appreciate that because i think you're right the work we do is local right it has to be local mm -hmm. and has to be meaningful right and again and, and now i speak racism with guacamole so i can actually do this sort of work um but to, to nancy's question too so the usd student body has undergone a significant demographic shift over the last 15 years, right? It used to be predominantly white and wealthy. And in the last few years, last five, five, six years, it has dropped to no longer being majoritarian white. Um, it sounds mm -hmm. increasingly Latinx um, and first generation, but it is still socioeconomically wealthier than a, than a public institution. And as we know, even though not being the majority, right? Like being a numerically majority, just solely white people, whiteness can be often the, the, defining sort of factor. Um, black students feel particularly small in both San Diego in general and USD in particular. We are a very small population. Um, but I would say it is predominantly white, but not majoritarily so, a lot of Latinx, although we know that Latinx is an, is an ethnicity, not necessarily a race. So we also can have plenty of white identified Latinx people. Um, and significant minority populations of Asian Americans, right? And that is our group. But what I've noticed at USD is that there's an increase of first generation, and also military veteran students, which are themselves actually a quite fascinating and diverse population. They are not, yeah. uh, people often assume that they have sort of a lockstep ideological viewpoint. They do not. They come older and mm -hmm. with a different set of life experiences, right? So now you're having college mm -hmm. students who are in their mid to late 20s often, who are coming in a very different set of experiences than 18 year olds. Yeah. Um. Dr. Charlie, how would you recommend we ensure parents will support this in lieu of recent policies we see in Virginia, Florida, and beyond? I think that's excellent, Annie. So I think that there's different sets of responsibilities. I think, for example, for white people, there has to be um, there has to be fear de-escalation because the the fear tactics have been very strong, right? And a lot of it is fear for like we feel like they're going to be replaced or attacked. I don't want to feel like a bad person. And there has to be a moment where you have to you have to de-escalate some of that rhetoric, right? So for white people, there has to be that de-escalating of because often the, the default is this is divisive. It's teaching us to hate ourselves and feel bad. And you're like, or if we love the place, we should be able to critically engage it and also be able to lovingly fix something. But we can't fix something if we don't know it's wrong. Imagine if your doctor only told you nice things about yourself. You're like, you're like, you have liver failure, but they're like, but your stomach is doing so great, right? That's not helpful, right? And so um, I think that is, a, is, is one tactic. I think there also has to be, absolutely mobilizing at school board level, right? Which is icky and exhausting, but that is what has been very effective over the last 15 years has been a conservative mobilization for control of schools and school districts because it is inherently designed to make school districts and, and schooling not equitable and not necessary, right? It's trying to make mm -hmm. it, it's trying to eliminate it in many ways. And so that has to be a level of creating these sorts of things. Given the challenges you've discussed, what keeps you motivated, grounded, and healthy to be able to continue the work? Whew. Always returning to the idea that this is not my job. I literally have it on a post-it on my wall in front of my computer at work. It just says this is the racism is not your job. Um, I think the other thing is I have to think about what does it mean to operate from a place of wonder over scarcity? And that sounds really woo-woo. I promise you it's not. It's the sense of I'm often from a place of like, oh my God, everything is limited. I have to fix all these things that are falling apart around me. But also I live in San Diego, 
and I get to do some pretty wonderful things all of the time and my body works and I get to do stuff. And so I force myself every morning um, when I get up um, and on my phone yet, I just have to sit and I'm very bad at this. So don't think that I'm some sort of magical master of this. I literally sit angrily cross arm like this because I don't have time for this. This is bullshit. I sit angrily for the first five minutes. I listen to some sort of song and I just say, what is something that is awesome? That What are you grateful for? What is this? What are you able to do? Because so often I have to think about all the things I need to do or I haven't done. And so I sit here and I'm like, what am I able to do? What can I do? And I think that helps. But I also remember that taking a break helps. I also, despite all of this, do not take myself that seriously. That is why I look like this. Um, but I think it's because there has to be an ability to step back. Because we are no good to DEI work or to the revolution or to any liberation if we're dead. We actually have to, we are the most valuable thing. And it is very hard to remember that, but I think it's very easy to remember that um, about your, your comrades or your co-conspirators. And so you need to say it to them and they need to say it to you. Thanks, Annie. So Annie says, thank you. Appreciate your and perspectives. I'm inspired by our youth leaders led by people like our own local Zy Bryant. Yeah, Zy Bryant. But I, I want to end with a, a last question for you. Sure. All right. I want you to think about your work not as a practitioner, but as, as a historian. Mm -hmm. And try and project into the future. From as much as you understand for your own uh, 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 perspective, the work that you do, how you bring those in, cast into the future for me this space of DEI. How would you... 10 years from now, articulate where you sit today, for instance? Mm -hmm. And I know that's a funny question, but it, it, it demands that you um, do some thinking about where do you move through this into the future, I think. Mm -hmm. I think that future me will be A, hotter than me, which I'm grateful for, but B, future me will be like, wow, he did his best with what he had. But when he looks back, I think one of the things I think I will, the phrase I'd use would be strategically limited. Strategically mm -hmm. limited is what this is. There's a recognition that what I am doing is, is band-aids for bone breaks, right? It is um, putting, uh, you know, you know, concealer over really significant skin rips. Um, and part of that recognizes the insufficiency of it, right? Part of that mm -hmm. means that like, I'll, I mean, I'll take people's money and I will do this DEI work because I do believe in it. But I also think that it needs to, I, I think it needs to go further. But also part of it, I will look back critically and say, we needed to push more because the stakes were higher than we realized. And I think that is not in, in contrast with me saying, again, it's still not my job. I think that part of where I'm at right now is sometimes more delicate and gentle because I'm trying to convince and persuade. But at mm -hmm. the same time, the stakes are higher than often I or any other person of color is delivering them a DEI. They're literally life and death. And sometimes people are like, but what if we just had nice cookies in the boardroom? And I'm like, I love that for you, Stacey, but that's not actually what this is, right? That's and so I think that push, be, pushing more is gonna have to be it, but also thinking about there's going to be things that I'm not even aware of that I'm not fully inclusive in yet. And I'm going to look mm -hmm. back and be like, oh, that was a little cringe. But that means that hopefully I've built a practice that allows for all of us to recognize we don't have it all together. We don't have to be scared and pretend like we have it all together so that we can beat everybody else down. This is actually a practice where we can grow and be better. And I hope that that will be borne out over time. You say those are wonderful words to end with. And, uh, and a, a beautiful goal to aspire to. We could hope. That one. Yeah. Thank you so much for um, speaking with us tonight. I look forward to more conversations with you about it's, these subjects and others as well. Um, and to all of you who have been here with us for this conversation, thank you. Um, we have more in store uh, for this particular topic. And so if you'll just stay tuned to our website when we announce our next um, discussion. Um, I'll see you then. Thank you. Thank you so much. This has been an absolute treat and a pleasure.